Hey everyone, I'm doing my John Maxwell. I'm a speaker with the John Maxwell team. And John Maxwell is a New York Times best-selling author. I'm doing this to develop my business and to grow other leaders. So you'll find that that's something that I've done consistently. I've done it with the One Campaign. I've done it with, we used to call it One.org. I've done it in my church. I've done it now. I'm doing it with John Maxwell. The difference with the other organizations is that I never received any money for it. I'm not receiving money for this talk, but I did put in a link on my YouTube where people can contribute. And because today is Giving Tuesday, if you are able to help me out with something, I would appreciate it. I'm out of work right now, but I am applying and I'm doing everything that I can. So. Today's chapter is to add growth leaders, lead followers, to multiply lead leaders. So one of the things that we have to do on our teams, we always have to have people on our teams that are better than us, that know more than us, that have more experience than us. And you'll find that with many of the tennis coaches, once they retire, they go on to coach other tennis players they go on to be captains of the teams. We saw that with John McEnroe. We saw that with um, Bjorn Borg. And we've seen it with other Australian tennis players. I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but they are famous for what they've done and what they've accomplished. So too with us, we have to be building leaders, not just followers, because you can find that some people have millions of followers, but if people are not getting anything from that, if they're not learning from them and we are not investing in them, then it's not really achieving anything. So we have to take the next step in our leadership by investing in ourselves so that other people can learn from us. John Maxwell gives powerful examples here about how he used to get exhausted by developing people. But he learned how to do it, and it became something that he became very good at. And we are always encouraging qualities that are undeveloped in people. That's where we get our acronym EQUIP from. We focus on where people's strengths are, not their weaknesses. Because if you focus on people's weaknesses, you're not helping anyone to reach their potential. You're just keeping them at that same level, that same minimum wage, that same opportunity, and they're not growing. And if they are doing the same thing over and over, they're going to want to leave your organization because they don't see any point in staying with you because there's no future. But if you invest in people and if you are looking at succession planning, then people can strive to get to the next level. If you're just developing followers and you just want people who are cookie cutters and are just going to say yes to everything you tell them to do, you're not developing leaders. You're just developing followers. So when we look at our time, where we're spending our time, with me and I know with the jobs I've been on, I've always focused on the top 20% of my teams. That's why even at Teleperformance, they used to ask me to train the new people that were joining. And that has been a pattern with me. It's not only there. It happened at TD, it happened at RBC, it happened at BMO. They always ask me to help the next people coming in, the next person joining the team because I was developing leaders. I wasn't just developing followers. If you're spending all your time and you're focusing on people's weaknesses, you're not putting people into the right jobs and into the right positions. So it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of your resources. It's a waste of everything that you're trying to accomplish because we want to have good succession plans in place so that people can take over. And we need to treat people as individuals. Because like for me, I get very upset when people are shouting at me and screaming at me and yelling at me. 
So I had to have a little more coaching. And even though my supervisors were saying, no, you were very good from day one, I know how sensitive I am. And I know that I had to really work on it, especially coming from a different culture, because I came here from uh, Zimbabwe and I worked in England, I worked in South Africa. We are very noisy culture. We like to have our music on, we like music, or we will have our TVs on, we make work fun. Whereas when you're working here, they'll tell you, oh, why do you have the music on? It sounds like you're having a party. That's how they took me off my jobs when I was working at Teleperformance. And they only did it to me. They targeted me because I had the customer on the call and I used to tell them, we're just enjoying, it's the Christmas season. And they're like, what's your name? What's your ID? I'm going to take you off that campaign. And we're like, but no, I'm doing, a, I'm helping you. I'm doing my job. They wouldn't listen. So that's how they got me out of my jobs because we are coming from a different culture to them. You'll find that culture in the sports environment where they're trying to get people, um, you know, to be enthusiastic, to be a cheering for their teams. If you don't have that enthusiasm on your teams, your teams are not going to be successful because they're just going to be coming in to get a paycheck. So if your customers are going to be that hard on people, they really need to examine their values because we're not living in a, a culture where only Americans matter. We're living in a culture where other nations matter and they have a lot to give, they have a lot to offer. And if people are not tapping into what we're bringing with us to Canada, to America, to England, then what's happening now is going to keep happening. People are going to go home. And if that's what the governments want, people are going to go home and they're going to help to build up their communities at home because we're not getting good paid jobs. We're not getting opportunities to buy homes. We're not getting opportunities to travel. So uh, that's why the uh, migration to England has gone down because people have been treated so badly, they're like, you know what, I might as well go back because I'm not getting the opportunities I need and I'll take all my education, my skills, whatever I've learned here, and I'll use it where I go back to my home country. A lot of people are going back to South Africa. A lot of people are going back to even places in Europe because Canada used to be a destination that people used to want to come to. Whereas now that has fallen. And it's because we are living in times that are like the wars. We're having food at schools for children. People are turning to food banks. It's becoming a state of desperation. And they're like, you know what? If it's a state of desperation here, it's a state of desperation in South Africa. I might as well go back because I'm not appreciated here. And that's not what the aim should be. But it's up to the people who are in management, the people who are out there building the values like me, we have to change it. It's the same with disabilities. People can put up slogans and say, oh, we support people with disabilities, put famous actors or famous sports people. But how are you treating your workers? Because if we can't get accommodation to work day shifts, if we can't get the reasonable accommodation we need, you obviously don't value us. And we are going to look for opportunities where we can have that. Because everybody ages, everybody grows old, everybody has bodies that start breaking down. Um, my kidneys are not going to function like a 20 year old. They're going to function like somebody who's over 50. So we need to take things like that into consideration. I'm not asking for the impossible and people are not asking for the impossible. We're asking for small adjustments to be made in the companies we're working at so that we can perform well. If I wasn't performing well, I wouldn't be in the top 20%. So you have to look at who you're investing time with, 
who you're leading. And once we have somebody following us and learning from us, then they are being invested in and they can take that and they can invest in somebody else. And that's how multiplication occurs. It's the same thing as when we go to church. When we go to church as a family, we're all being taught the same values. And then we take those values out into our communities. I take my old clothes to the church when I can, when I have clothes to give to the St. Vincent de Paul. And I do that whenever it's possible. So do many people who come to my church. I'm not the only one doing it. And that's how we build up our communities. So we have to take care of our bodies, our minds, our spirits. Any leaders who practice the law of explosive growth make a shift from followers mats to leaders mats. So instead of looking at who are we adding to our teams, we're looking to multiply what we're doing so that we have good explosive growth on our teams. And John Maxwell just mentions three things. Leaders are hard to find, they're hard to keep, and they are hard to gather. Because leaders tend to be like me, very entrepreneurial. We're interested in taking risks. We're interested in building businesses. We're interested in making good money, having good opportunities to travel, to do things, to in home, have home ownership. We're interested in other people. And we help people, we mentor people. We're good at taking action. That's something I do on the One Campaign. It's something I do at church. So we have to look at where our natural gifting is, with where we can help in a crisis, and we have to look at who's influencing us. So today I saw a tweet on uh, an X, they call it X now, an X message saying which tennis player did you love the most or something like that and they had Roger Federer and they had Serena Williams but for me it wasn't them my love for tennis started long before that it was Martina Navratilova and Chrissy Everett those were my favorites and John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg and for our Zimbabwe tennis players it was Orlando Larenko so I told them, because I'm not from their generation. Yes, I watch them, I love them, I support them. But my passion for sports and for tennis started long, long before that. So these are the points that we need to remember for the law of explosive growth. And if you're interested in becoming a John Maxwell speaker, you can always reach out to me if you're looking for somebody to help to help with transformation on your teams, your organizations. You can reach out to me. I can help with developing tailored programs or tailored learning. And I have people on my team who they're investing in themselves. They're way ahead of me. They're far ahead of me. But that's why I stay with them because I always learn something new from them. And that's why it's good to be with people who are far ahead of you, because then you can learn from them. If you're only with people who are at the same level as you, the same thinking as you, you're not going to learn anything different. So I'm sure for some people, I'm way far ahead of them. But that's the way it should be. When my mentees come to me, they don't come to me because they know everything. They come coming to me because they want to learn something from me. When people are following me on YouTube, they're not just following me for the sake of it. They're following me because it's something that they can learn and then I can help them with the implementation or I can reach out to people in the community, the universities, if they want to change, if they want to adapt. And here in Canada, they have this um, thinking, which is a very false thinking that if your life has not fallen into place and the people you are doing business with are not good, that's why things didn't work out for you. You must do a business with good people. So who is good? Because I'm going to look uh, use Elvis Presley's 
dad as an example, he went to prison because he forged a check because they didn't have money to eat. And his son went on to become one of the greatest entertainers on our planet. So who is good? If you're sending somebody to jail just because they couldn't buy a loaf of bread to eat to feed their family, is that good? And if you're allowing bankers to take millions, the size of economies, is that good? Who, who does Canada define as good people? That's what I would like to know. Because I don't see their people as being as good as they say they are. And I say that because, yes, I'm a citizen of Canada, but I also came here from Zimbabwe. I was in England when the land grab started happening, and I had the points to come into this country, and that's how I came in. So who is good? Because they obviously think they are all better than us. They're doing business with good people, and the rest of us are being left behind. So I'd like to know who, who they think of as being good, because they all do it. And it's inappropriate. Why do they come to the church then if they're good? I go to the church because I know I'm not that good. I, I very uh, seldom will say that I'm good. I might have good skills, good talents, but I'm always falling short of what God's expectations are. I can be very difficult, I can be very sensitive, I have my limitations. But for them, all the big shots, the CEOs and the ones who are earning 300,000 a year, 400,000, apparently they are the good people and we are the rubbish people, including the people who are leading U of T. So I don't know. Because that's not, that's not what my Bible teaches me and that's not what my Bible says. Even when, I, the, when the police did this investigation, they told me to report what was happening. I did everything that they told me to do and then they were frustrated because they spent 77 million and the banks wouldn't confirm that they were making the calls to all my employers. So is that good? Is it my fault? It's not my fault. I did what everybody told me to do, including the directors who gave me directions. So I'd like to know what Canada defines as good, because what they are saying is good is not necessarily good. There should have been no reason for Trump to tell us, President Trump, that we need to tighten our border security, that we need to stop letting in illegal migrants including Indian families, that there have to be systems in place to do things the right way. So, I don't know, but it's very interesting when you see how they post. And what, he's, what John Maxwell is saying is true. Leaders have the executive, the people who are earning those big bucks, they have to ask us to develop their team members to lead, to help to uh, grow people, and they have to pay us what we are worth. Not pay us minimum wage and then say, oh, thanks, now there's no opportunity. They took the contract away, so you're going to be out on the street and you can claim EI. That is not right. They have to ask us to do it. And they also have to celebrate our successes and encourage us to come up to the next level. And they can't say who's going to do the work because there's always a new generation coming up. There's always young people coming up, so they have to give us that opportunity to get to the same level that they got, to earn those $100,000 salaries and the 300000 and have the private planes and fly all around the world because we also deserve it. We've done a lot. I have done a lot for this country in my leadership, in my volunteering, in my taking actions to help the poor in Africa, in India. One.org doesn't only focus on Africa. 
We've had different campaigns where we focused on Spain, we focused on India, we focused on different places. Right now the focus is on Africa. But the African Infrastructure Bank is also doing their share. They're not sitting back and waiting for international aid. Just like me, people there are investing in their careers, they're investing in their education, they're helping each other. And it's not like Canada is perfect. We also have a lot of people here that are being left behind, including me, that are living off debt. So I'm also taking steps to change my life so that I can get to that level. And people do us down, but it comes back on them. Whatever Colonel Tom Parker did to destroy Elvis, you can't say, oh, it was an addiction. That, that's not right. If it was just an addiction, he could have sought help to get his addiction sorted out. He destroyed that family, and he destroyed the trust that was put in him. And yet Elvis kept giving him opportunities. He kept saying, well, he didn't know until the end. But it's not right when people say it's just an addiction and that they can take action. They have a lot of programs in place to help people. The same way I go out and I exercise every day, I eat healthy, I do things to keep my mental health strong, to keep my physical health strong. We also take action and we do that so that the next generation can learn from us because God can call us back anytime. It doesn't mean we give up on our dreams. It doesn't mean we give up on wanting home ownership or wanting to travel first class or wanting to have those experiences of owning private jets. We don't have to give up on it. And for us who are visible minorities and people with disabilities, the cards are stacked against us. But things are changing. And we have to keep that hope. We don't have to let our dreams die. Why should we? It's like saying, oh, well, I'm just going to resign that, okay, I'm going to hell. Because life here is so hard, I might as well just commit crimes and make the best of it. And then when I go to hell, I can train other people to and evil spirits and all that. What a load of rubbish. So that's my thoughts on the law of explosive growth. I hope it helps you. And I'm happy to see more people are signing up for my talks on YouTube. Please share the post and encourage people to listen and to learn. And if you hear of opportunities for me in administration, in speaking, in training, reach out to me. I would be very grateful.